Well, um, probably should give a little bit of an intro here and then um, get started. I yeah. did want to highlight. I did want to highlight something that I posted in. Um, I kind of parked it in Advanced Star, but it already looks like it's going to be taken care of by Ryan himself. But I did. I was reading ahead a little bit and looking at that introduction for the like the OOP section. I think the introduction is really important. I think there's some concepts in there that we probably should yes. talk about and clarify. So uh, I think he's going to cover it. So just, I guess, for the group, if we hopefully we get through all the way through function operators. Um, yeah, but, this is a pretty short chapter. So, yeah, so I have a feeling that we'll get through it. Um, but just a heads up, make sure you check out that introduction section because there's a lot of like vocabulary and stuff that. Um, yeah, I looked at the shares. I looked at the introduction and I looked at um, the base types chapters. And, and fortunately for Ryan and us, the base types chapter is also short. It even doesn't have an exercise in it. So it's like super short. <laughs> <laughs> Not even one single exercise. I'm sure he's going he's gonna to hit us hard with the uh, object oriented chapter proper S3, R6, and S4 when we get to him. But I, I will say, I, you know, I don't want to cut too much in, into the time, but S3. Um, yeah, I, I'm gonna need some help with that one. I read through the chapter a little bit already and I'm just like, yeah, I'm gonna have to read this a few times to really understand it. So, um, cool. Well, that's good. We're, that's what we're here for. So, yeah, cause it's, it's like S3 is like, I mean, it's probably simple for some people who really understand OOP, but like, yeah, we'll get to it. Um, but, but yeah, so actually, tonight, Oh, go ahead. Go I, ahead. I would say the opposite. S3 is a multi-method type thing, you know, uh, multiple dispatch type thing. So unless you come from a language like Julia or something like that, you're probably, I mean, if you come from Java, that's going to be like really strange, S3. <laughs> R6 is more like how Java works, I think. I think we'll find. I actually don't know much about R6. It's just based on reading the introduction chapter. But <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah, so I think we'll probably just get started. Um, I do have to mention that in probably a few weeks, um, around like mid March, just to keep everybody up to date, is obviously like the daylight savings time change. And if this is your first book club, because uh, everything is kind of automated, so John the Geek kind of automates things. <laughs> so um, because there's a discrepancy between here and the UK and Europe. And other places, um, it kind of messes with the scheduling. And so there will be about two weeks that we'll have to skip, but we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but I think I'll just turn it over to you, Ron, and then you'll take us off. Yep. Uh, so this chapter, chapter 11, is the last chapter in the functional programming section, I guess this is called. And then so next week, as we said already, we're going to start with the object oriented stuff. So this chapter is actually pretty straightforward. I thought it was pretty easy compared like to the other chapters. I think he's given us a little break before we get dig it into the next most co more complicated stuff. Um, but uh, function operators are pretty straightforward. So our goal here is to just define what a function operator is for our uh, explore some of the existing ones we might find useful in our work. And then also just as a demonstration, make our own function operator. That's what he did in this chapter. So first, what is a function operator? A function operator is simply a function that takes one or more functions as input and then returns a function. So it's a mapping from functions to functions. That's a function operator. And Tadley mentions these are special cases of function factories since they return functions like function factories do. The most the use cases that he shows here in this chapter are wrapping an existing function to add some additional capability. And so in Python, you would call this a decorator as Tan pointed out in the Slack channel. Um, and in other languages, you know, who knows what they're called, but <laughs> a decorator is a good term because that's what they're kind of doing, decorating the existing function with some new capability. And this first example here just demonstrates that in the most straightforward way. We just have a function called chatty, which takes a function as an argument F, so we pass a function. We uh, force the function to evaluate so that it you know, can't be changed on us. And then uh, return a function that takes an argument x and then just simply calls that function that we saved in the closure, right, in the environment. And then after it's done, it says, oh, processing, it adds some little extra bit of text out there and then returns the result that the function gave. So we have a function here that just squares its argument. If we make it chatty by calling chatty f, 
And then, um, actually this surprised me that this works. Oh yeah, this works, sorry. Think of something else. Uh, and we just use a map, for example, here. So we call chatty F. It'll just do the same thing as F would do, but now as it's squaring, it'll tell us its progress. So that might be a useful thing. Like, oh, I want to know like how far along this function is evaluating so I can wrap it with this little processor to do that. This little wrapper, this decorator, as it were. So that's the essence of it. There's really nothing that we don't know already, right? It's not using any new things. It's using things we already know about. It's just an idea, which is kind of cool. Then we want to talk about some existing function operators. Uh, the two main ones that the book talks about, which are extremely useful, are PERS safely operator and the memoize operator. And these are contained in these libraries. So the safely one uh, is kind of cool. What it does is it captures the errors and turns, it essentially turns the errors into data. <laughs> so instead of stopping, it just saves the error and presses right on. So it takes the uh, takes a function and turns it into a new function that will return pairs, where the first element of the pair is the data if it was successful. Otherwise, the second element is whatever error occurred, and the first element is null. That's what safely does essentially, right? So just to demonstrate that, we create this list of um, vectors, except that oops, we got one thing in this list is not a vector. So if we try to, I this you know when you make this in. Uh, knit, you have to make sure that you don't evaluate this cell because it actually your whole your whole pro, your whole completion will come to a roaring stop when it hits this thing with this error in primitive sum blah 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 and valid type character, right? So to fix that, we can use safely. We can wrap it in safely. So now we're going to say if you get an error, just keep on going and just let me tell me about it later type thing. Uh, one note is that before we're using map double here, I'm using just map because we're returning lists now, right? And we can save that and this little transpose things just to change the order you know so that i get a list of two lists as it were rather than four lists of two things right that's all i'm trying to do there that's what hadley does there and so you come out with this and you, you get the first thing is the result so that when it's valid we get a result the proper sum of that list and when it's not valid because there's an error we get a null here and in the other list the error list we get nulls when it works and we get a list of whatever the heck the error thing spit back on us as oh, invalid type. So as Hadley points out, this is extremely handy when you're doing a lot of different models and you want to just crank through them all and look at which ones fail later. Or and I can imagine a, a lot of different uses for this. And I'm glad I learned about it because I didn't know about it before. So I'm just going to start using that more and more. So I don't get, you know, when you're trying to do something that's going to, especially with something that takes a long time to process and you have to, you know, you're going to go get coffee or whatever and hope this is done. And you come back, it turns out the minute you left the desk, it crashed and all the rest of the 15 minutes you're chatting with your neighbors, nothing was going on. So <laughs> that's, that's no good. So yeah, that's uh, a very useful thing. Adley points out that there's some other function operators in a similar vein. Uh, possibly it doesn't return a list, it just returns a value, but when there's an error, it just, you know, you give it some, you give it some default value instead of, uh, you know, so for example, that previous one, if I would use possibly, I wouldn't have to bother with all transpose and everything else, but I wouldn't know what the error was. I would just, if I like put a zero or NA or something like that, I know something went wrong, but I wouldn't know what it was. Uh, quietly just turns off, uh, it turns all, not only the errors, but any kind of output messages and everything else into, uh, into data. I guess that kind of scroll, but in the components of the output as it were. This is why is this little box? I guess I'll figure that out later. And then um, auto browser just simply launches a browser whenever you're, there's an error, so you can debug. There's actually something I don't know much about. I've never really used the browser much. I, I learned about that. Do you guys use oh. that a lot? The browser, the debugging browser. Oh yeah, it's my. It is my favorite thing for debugging. Um, that's why I was excited to see auto browser because. I haven't played around with it yet, but then you don't you don't have to dump a browser function or you don't have to drop a browser function into your brow or into your function to kick off a debugging session. Um, there is uh, Jenny Bryan had this really good presentation. Oh, that she talks about like she talks about debugging in sense and browser was one component of it. Like browser allows you to pretty much just like stop execution but like see what's inside of a function and i like i probably use browser every single day um i'm a huge advocate for it because it, it helps 
Uh, let me see if I can find the presentation because this one was really, really good. Um, I'll put it in the chat, but she okay, great. I appreciate she does an excellent job with it. <clears throat> Excuse um, me. But yeah. I and then possibly is oh sorry go ahead no you go ahead no possibly is actually kind of nice too because like the one thing that i usually use this for like safely or possibly is like if you are trying to and i think i made mention this before um like if you're trying to like use like to interface with an api that pages and so sometimes what happens is like if you're using an API that returns a page that has no data, but you know that there's going to be further like data with further requests. You could use safely and possibly to kind of skip over those or to set like a specific value based on a condition to say like, oh, you know, end page or whatever, right. continue on. So you don't have to like worry about like not getting any data because the API doesn't return data back to you. So super super excellent function if you're using map um, interface with like apis cool um i was just going to point out one thing that when i was browsing around the per documentation there is one uh, there is another i was going to say one more but there may be more than one more but there is one other function operator that's worth pointing out and that's called compose and the reason why it's worth pointing out first what is compose to compose takes two functions and composes them so you get a new function, which is the result of applying the first function and then applying the second function. Right? So it takes two functions and then you get a new function that first that it first applies the first function, and then applies the second function. That's probably the most fundamental idea of a function operator that there actually can be. <laughs> and what else can you do with functions? What other operation can you imagine doing with functions besides composing them like that? That doesn't depend on what the types or anything else about the functions are. And I point that out because it is a function operator that is not a decorator. It's not, it's not used for the purpose of wrapping of wrapping or anything like that. It could be useful, for example, though, to create decorators from decorators, right? You have like four or five decorators you always use together, compose them together, and you got a new decorator that does all, all of them one, one after another. So that's kind of an interesting application of uh, compose. So I didn't have a chart for that because I just now I just kind of just thought of it <laughs> this morning. <laughs> but I thought that'd be a useful thing to point out. Um, you don't really see it too much. It seems to me like it seems like, oh, that's obviously tremendously useful. How come I haven't been using that? And the reason why is because there's another kind of composing in R that we use all the time that's pipe. So pipe kind of does that anyway, it just does it in a funny way. It doesn't take functions, it takes expressions and it does some kind of magic, right? To, uh, to not evaluate the expression, but hold it and then, then, come, then you know, stick your result into the next function in the pipe, right? I'm hoping that's something we're going to learn about like way long time, way, way in this, uh, well, I guess you can't see it here, but in the chapters on metaprogramming, right? That's a metaprogramming technique, quasi quotation and the rest of it must be involved. I assume, I don't know. It seems like magic to me right now, but that's the reason why we don't really use Compose very much because the same kind of thing can be accomplished with a pipe in much in a more, in a more R way, <laughs> right? Okay, anyway, that was my little side on Compose. The other example he gives of a, of a function operator is memoize. I, I hope that's how you say it. That's how I say it, memoize. And the idea here is pretty straightforward. You're just simply saving your computation. Like if you have an expensive computation that you're going to want to call over and over again, it would make sense to like cache that somewhere and say, well, don't, I already asked for X, I already asked of F of 37. Don't, you know, don't recompute it. Just give me the same answer back again. And that's essentially what memoize does. Um, He'll just, it, so here's, a, here's an example, like here's his slow function, he just, to make it slow, he just puts a sleep in it, right? But um, if you call it, it takes, you know, it takes one second because I put the sleep in here, right, slow. If I call it again, it recomputes the same, for the same value one, it recomputes the same value one over again, of course, it has to execute its body again, and of course, it takes a whole second to do it again. Well, that seems wasteful, right? If this, the sleep one is meant to, simulate some complicated uh complication complicated uh computation going on there in some ways this is kind of a bad example because it's the body of the function does a random number <laughs> thing so you actually would want it to re-execute every time but whatever it doesn't matter so if you memoize it um by using this function operator memoize slow function i get this new function called fast function and if i then call it with the number one well the first time it still takes a whole second because it has to do with the, it has to save the value. 
But then when I call it again right away, it just returns the same value right away. No time elapsed at all. So this is extremely useful when you have complicated computations going on. Like he gives an example using Fibonacci series, but I imagine there's some practical examples where you also want to use this to kind of speed up your calculations. You can only, you gotta be careful, he says, to make sure we only use this for like pure functions, or if you are, are using it for impure functions, to be just very, very careful that, that things aren't gonna change in between calls. So if there's no side effects, this is pretty safe to do, as long as you're aware of the trade-off. And the trade-off is your trading speed for memory, right? Because every time you call a function, it's gonna save value. If it's unusual to want to request the same value again, um, for the same argument that is, then that would probably be just a waste of memory saving all those attempts, right? But if, for example, you're doing a search on some static thing, it might make sense. In fact, that's what Microsoft does, right? It caches your searches. So the next time you go back and ask for something, it will quickly give it to you. And there is a trade-off because some older versions, at least of the Microsoft search thing, used to, first of all, take a long time. And second of all, use a lot of memory. <laughs> so Microsoft's still working on that. Oh, hang on a second. Sorry, my, my dad uh, was getting a procedure done, so my mom's just updating me on uh, how he's doing. Okay, so that's memoize. Any questions about any of this so far? It seems pretty straightforward, I thought. I don't know. Yeah, memoize is something that's really interesting. Um, not just like if you're talking about like analysis scripts and stuff like that, but um, it's also brought up in the context of like mastering Shiny where it talks about caching. So if you're creating like a web application using Shiny, you can use like some of these like function operators to memoize some of the functions to cache some of the processes or cache some of your functions that are running on the back end of your Shiny app to make your Shiny oh. app faster. Yeah, makes it's, sense. Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of an interesting concept, you know, cause it's outside of just like, analysis code but like when you're generating web apps using shiny you can use this kind of same idea of memoizing your functions to cache them so great okay well so since it's a relatively short chapter i thought i would actually take a look at just one of these exercises here um because i thought it was interesting too you know like safely that's cool like well how the heck does it work right <laughs> and that's actually one of the exercises so you can you know type in the word safely and it'll spit out the code and oh, this is nice and short. Oh, wait, it just calls another function <laughs> called capture error. And what this is what interests me about this, this is one of those cases where capture error is if you like type in now capture error, you'll get nothing. Or if you type in question mark capture, error, you'll be like, I don't know what, what's capture. I never heard of it. And here's one of these cases where it's in this namespace, this namespace that you don't normally see. It's only associated with the library. We just one of those things we learned about in uh, somewhat recently, right? And so I'm like, how can I get at that? Uh, my first attempt was to the way I did it when I did the exercise I just said well give me the functions environment and then give me the capture error and that worked right <clears throat> but I looked at the answer book as it were and it, it uses this operator which I had not seen before it's hardly as far as I can tell it's not in this book the three colon operator uh can get you the namespace of a package so if I do per colon 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 capture error then I can get that. So that's kind of a handy thing to know about, which I did not know about. <laughs> and if we do that, we get the code from uh, the capture error. And there's nothing really surprising about how it works. It just uses try catch, right? And so if the thing succeeds, it returns a list where the result is whatever the heck the code was. Otherwise, and the error is null. If it fails, then it will you know, work your way down here. You'll see it returns a uh, list where the result is otherwise. Because otherwise, it's an optional argument to um, to uh, safely. I couldn't think of the other function for some reason. Safely, that you could give instead of giving a null for the result, uh, and then it'll give the error in the second part of the list. So that's pretty cool. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. I thought. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty. That's pretty sleek right there. Like it's yeah. just passing it into a try catch. Yeah. Um, there. Uh, the three, the three colon, um, they talk about this in, um, they talk about this in our package development. There's a book that Hadley wrote about ah, package okay. development. And I think like, if I remember correctly, like the three, the three colon is like, if you write a function that's internal to your package 
and you only want to make it internal to your package. So you don't want to open that interface or that function to like users of your package. You can define it this like you can define it without like exporting it to the namespace or to like the the or the the not the working environment, but like you don't want to open it up. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to open it up to the entire package namespace or something like that. That's where you use that like triple colon, but oh, you can still okay. do that with any of them. You can do that with any like any package though, is you can access any of those interface or you can access any of those functions using the triple colon. Um, but I'm trying to find the exact place where they talk about it in the our packages book, but they talk about trade-offs and why you should do it and should not do it. And it's kind of an interesting discussion. Yeah, it's pretty cool. This is the first time I actually ran into that when looking at the guts of these functions. Like, oh, wait a minute. Hey, we just learned about this. Great. I actually know what this means. <laughs> I was happy about that. I need to do that packages book at some point. Put that on my list. It's yeah, no, the, the package development, but our packages, and they've they've done a huge modification and update to it. Like um, it's even changed since the last time I read it, which was about three or four months ago. There's a lot of changes to it. Oh, okay. But it's well, it's well worth it if you're um, interested in it. Okay. Uh, the last section of this chapter talks about uh, an example of making your own function operator. And his use case is that imagine you have some list of URLs, presumably all longer than just two, and you want to you know download them all, but you right so you could just okay i'll just you know. Uh, take that list and use the walk function we learned about right to walk down that list and we'll download those things into this temporary directory i'm using the download file function and i'll be fine. Uh, but we might have a problem with the fact that if we hit the same website over and over again with fast calls like that, we might we might choke right on that. So he says, okay, well, we, will make, we can make, well, we can fix that. We can make a little delay by wrapper function, function operator that'll add a little delay. So just take, this is, generic, this is a generally useful thing. So we don't have to just do it in a special case. We can write a function operator for it. Delay by, which simply takes the function and takes how much you want to delay it by. And then, um, of course, forces them. It's always awkward, but <laughs> there's a lazy evaluation workaround. And then, uh, then it will then return new function, which will first sleep for the right amount of time, and then call your function with whatever other arguments you called it with, using the three dot notation. And so we can check check that. We can just say, okay, if I generate 100 random numbers, that takes no time at all. But if I do it with the delay by 100 uh milliseconds i'm sorry yeah 100 milliseconds right um this is the 100 millisecond part right here <laughs> then it uh it works it, it does call a function but delays by the the appropriate amount and it gives a second example the dot every which it's the same kind of idea but now we're going to take a function then what the nth with the module you want to use to uh put a dot and we're so in this case we take advantage of this closure, right? So we're gonna save a little local variable i of zero. And we use our, you know, scope operator, sc scope assignment, I guess, scope assignment operator to, or super assignment. I forget what it's called now. What is it called? Scope assignment, super assignment. Super assignment, I think. Super assignment. Yeah, okay. super assignment. To uh, update that variable, so we're gonna keep a count. Every time the function is called, we're gonna keep a little count. And if that count is, uh, you know, modulo n is zero, which means it's the nth count. Then we're going to put out a little dot, but no matter what we do, we're always going to call a function with whatever the arguments were. And this works as well. We can walk through uh, list one through ten with this, you know, can generate a random random. This root run if is just here to run if. <laughs> I keep saying it that way, which always confuses me. Run if, <laughs> run if what? <laughs> but uh, the, this uniform number generator, and we're going to dot every ten, and it does seem to work. So he shows how we can then express that using the, and he goes through a little bit more detail in this, but the end result is kind of nice where he's just using the pipe operator to express this in a very clear way, right? You know, we're going to walk the URLs, the path, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to uh, call download file, then we're, we're going to wrap it in dot every 10, and we're also going to wrap it in delay by 100 milliseconds. So it's pretty cool, I thought.
I mean, it's I very think expressive. It's so good. Yeah. I think it's so good that Hadley, even in the per package, there is a function called slowly. I'm going to pass along oh. here. Which I think is now that I know what function operators are, I think slowly is a function operator because it looks like it takes a function and modifies yep. it. Yep. Yep. That's what it does. So that's a function operator. Yeah. <laughs> right another good one. Front. Right. That's a good example. Yeah. Yeah, but it returns a function that takes the same argument as dot f, or it returns a different value as described. Wait, what do you mean a different value? Where does it say it returns a different value in the description? That's weird. A function that takes the returns a different value as described above. I don't know. Cool I've never used about, it. I've seen yeah. it, but I've seen it before, but I've never used it. I think it doesn't return a different value. It just returns a different, it just has a side effect. What's nice about slowly and some of these other per functions, of course, they, he doesn't really emphasize this, but they can take formulas and because it uses that as mapper thing. If you look up here, I think there's an as mapper. Oh, I'm not on that page anymore. I'm going to jump up there just for a second. See this as mapper? Mm -hmm. That's so you can pass not only just functions, but you can also pass in these like formulas and stuff. Uh, that kind of clears that up because I was always yeah. wondering what that as mapper was doing. Hmm. So all these per functions, um, I guess, I think all the per functions can like map and everything else can take these formulas. I think you can use as mapper yourself, but is there a better way to do that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I've only seen the as mapper used a couple times. I know Oops, that, that blog screen. post that I shared a while ago from Colin Fay, he was using as mapper. Actually, I think he was using it for that reason because he was passing a um a formula to something, but let me double check. Yeah, there's also adds function, which is what adds mapper just forwards to, but from our lane. Anyway, very cool stuff. Sorry, I got distracted myself. <laughs> yeah, they're still, my dad's still, they're still waiting to check them out, so so I just, Get the update on. Uh, where was I? I kind of lost track. Was I? Oh yeah. So that's basically that. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, one last exercise. Um, I just picked this one because I thought it was an interesting question. He says, "Should you memoize file dot download?" I'm gonna say no. Download dot fire. I think it's actually supposed to be. Written, but yeah. I'm gonna say no mainly because of because it's not it's not technically pure right maybe i'm thinking that it's because it's dependent like if you do file download and you're depending on like you know like a, a file that's consistent that file might not always be consistent so if you memoize it and you're continually running that memoized function you would expect it that that file would not change, but that file could change, right? Or am I thinking of it incorrectly? That's the, the, exactly the same uh, answer I gave when I looked at it. I'm like, oh, I don't, you know, it seems dangerous because if I want to, you know, I'm doing some work, I download those files and later, I'm like, oh, I want to update that thing. It's not going to work. But on the other hand, I could think of a possibility that you might want to memoize, and that is if, you're, if your list may contain duplicates files, maybe, or duplicate URLs, mm -hmm. And then you're like, well, I just want to, I don't want to have to re-download it. I already got it, you know? That's like in one session or something like that. I, didn't, I forgot to look at what the answer says, the answer book. <laughs> I feel like it would be a problem though, right? Because if you're like, have a URL, but then the function, the memoized function would just save another copy of the file, right? But you already have the, you already have the file. That makes sense? Yeah. Um, 
yeah so like i think that would be the main problem is like you would ha actually have two copies one inside the function and then one where you on your computer where you actually download oh, it that's not yeah. a good that's a good point yeah. these are big things you're downloading you're gonna be like filling your yeah. memory up with whole entire urls <laughs> yeah yeah it's probably then, a bad idea in general yeah there's also um this is so like when you're doing file dot download you can specify um flags to the underlying downloading code so like um file dot download in mine i'm using wget um and then it, within wget you can pass it a flag that's like check to see if the files change or not and have it on Wait, is, is file dot download a thing yeah i think so what is i mean i know there's download dot file but both the but the book talks about and the book uses uh, download dot file yeah. but then the question asks about file dot download and I'm like, what is that? <laughs> oh, maybe they just maybe it's a typo. Yeah, I meant I meant download dot file. Yeah, it's, it was weird that both the book and the answer key, key both talk about that file dot download. Like, what is that? <laughs> yeah, I think it's just a typo, um, like you said. Yeah, I think it might probably be the same thing. I'm not sure. We'll need something else. But yeah, so like for download dot file at least, um, you can specify a flag that checks to see if it's downloaded uh, or not. Yeah. And then it's like that one will check if there's oh. like the dates on the files have changed on the server you're downloading from and then it, or the file size is different. And then you just will automatically do that, which is nice too, because you can set it to resume as well. So if you have like a spotty internet, I just usually keep rerunning the same code until it finishes. Very cool. had lots of problems downloading files so. <laughs> i just checked the answer i think we're i think we're both i think we both hit on the two points that were what what the answer said in the book large files like you don't want to you don't want to just clutter up your memory with large files and then also too it's it it assumes that the file that you're downloading is immutable which is not always the case yeah. Especially if you're trying to download files from the internet <laughs> that you have no control over. Um, I, I feel like that concept comes up again of like checking the file, like especially, I remember seeing something in Mastering Shiny, there was something with that too, where it would check, where it would check the file date or check the file name. And if it updated that, then it wouldn't download the file. Like there was some function that Hadley talked about in Mastering Shiny that did something like that, but it's really cool. Well, I think that's what I had. Um, any, any other observations that people had while reading the book, reading that chapter? Um, I appreciated the, the slowdown for a little bit. It was nice to kind of like fully grasp. Yes, yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. After, after some of these other chapters, I'm like, Oh, this is a brief. I got lucky on this one. I was thinking of myself. <laughs> I roll, I, I, you know, on a good roll on that one. Are you think I got a good draw <laughs> on the deck of chapters? Yeah, I felt I felt very happy that we got a little bit of a break and then I can wrap my mind around some of this one. This one. So, uh, I, by the way, I just want to ask people like before we go on to the next section, like what is everybody's experience with other languages? I mean, I have a lot of experience with a lot of different languages, not a, nothing, you know, I'm not like a language expert, but I've played around with a lot of languages, to put it that way. Um, for me, a little bit of Python and then C, um, a decent amount of C stuff, mostly for like, if there's a inner loop in R that's too slow, I'll just rewrite it in C usually. Um, so nothing, no big projects, but small, like small pieces of code. Yeah. yeah. That's a useful skill to have. It's not terribly difficult to acquire because C is a small language in and of itself. So yeah, especially the parts that you need to like speed up R code. Yeah, for sure. Probably the hardest part is learning how to interface with R code. <laughs> yeah. That is actually the hardest part. I still don't really grasp it. Sometimes it just works and sometimes it doesn't. I don't really understand what's happening, but. <laughs> Looks like chapter 25, we'll look at that a little bit using C++, but I think the parts of C++ he's gonna use are essentially just C. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd probably say R is probably my number one language that I probably know the most or have the most depth in. I've tried using Python here and there. I would not say I'm an expert in that. 
Um, SQL, if you could consider SQL a programming language, um, probably have a fair amount. I wouldn't say like a fully in-depth. I could use it to do some basic operations like pull data and select it and filter it and general operations like that. Um, and then a little bit of a little bit of Lua. I wouldn't say I fully oh. know Lua, but I've I've looked at it a little bit, but I wouldn't say like I'm fully like would know everything about Lua, but um, but R is probably the one that I have most depth in. What are you using Lua for? I'm just curious. Um, so I made the switch over to using um, NeoVim, which ah, gotcha. So and that to get that set up, you have to use, well, there's easier ways to do it, which I probably thinking about it, hindsight's 2020, I probably would have went an easier route, but to get that customized and to get it to configure, you need to know a little bit of Lua. And so um, it it's pretty intuitive, but like I said, there's just some things like, cause you're, I think the hardest part about learning another language is like, you know what you want to do. It's just getting into the syntax that you needed to do it. And so it's, exactly. just like, uh, it's like the hardest part. Um, and then you get like mixed up. That's my hardest part with like Python is like, I'm like, oh, I try and do our things in Python. And it's like, oh, it just doesn't work. I do that all the time, back and forth, both, both ways. My biggest yep, problem so. is I keep writing equal signs all the time. <laughs> Instead of the arrow when I'm doing R. But which I, works, I, by the way, it's not an error. I, so I just, I, I, I think the, when I'm like in Python all, and it's bad sometimes I'll do like, cause I think there's one nice thing with, uh, with Python is you can do like method chaining. So you can like, yeah. you know, with, especially I use it a lot for like pandas cause it makes pandas way more tolerable um, <laughs> to use. Um, but sometimes I'll like just write like a pipe operator. I'm like, wait, that's, that's a completely <laughs> wrong thing of language. Um, but yeah, I would say like mostly R. Um, I use Python a lot more just at work. Um, Python's not like, yeah. I mean, obviously, I, I also write a lot of SQL. <laughs> so I write, I write a ton of SQL. Um, I guess like I, I probably prefer R um, in some ways. Like I, I do like Python. Um, it's just It's just a bit different. And I, I sometimes need to like, stop myself from I think forcing what I would do in R and Python because um, sometimes it just doesn't look right or it just yeah it just, it just doesn't look right yeah I've actually What's the... oh sorry go ahead, go ahead R. I've actually fully switched just to using equal signs in R just <laughs> yeah, you... it <laughs> and then occasionally it bites you where you're like oh I actually can't I need just to use an arrow operator but yeah I you can tell when I've started like editing people's code because <laughs> it'll be like Arrows, arrows, and all of a sudden, just equal signs everywhere. <laughs> like, what is this monstrosity? What is what is it by you? I'm not actually sure. I've never run into a problem. Um, so if you, um, for example, if you're doing like benchmarking code, so like micro benchmark, and then you do an assignment operator inside the micro benchmark, uh, you have to use the arrow, otherwise it won't assign. If you use the equal sign, it tries to treat it as a function argument, and then that messes it up. Um, so that's, I think, the only real case for it. So like um, if you're like doing micro benchmark um, or, and then inside the function, you're like, oh, assign mean value equals mean or whatever. If you use equal signs, it won't work. And arrow sign will work. Um, but that's, that's the only case I've come across so far. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, my code, you look at my code, you'll see like, sometimes you'll see arrows, sometimes you'll see equal sizes. Usually I'll go back and change the equal size to arrows to make it look better, but <laughs> requires an extra step. <laughs> Maybe I should just give up. I like, I like your approach. <laughs> just leave them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. All right, cool. So some people have some experience with Python, so they'll probably be pretty comfortable with some of the object oriented stuff, but um, I still think S3 is going to be different enough. Um, yeah. Yeah, from what I know about S3, it's not really an object system like you would think about it. It kind of just like mimics it, but. Um, yeah, it's like generic functions more. Yeah. Cool, that's I, all I have. I think it's, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Ron. I was just saying that's all I had. I just wanted to ask that question that was interesting to know. Yeah, I think it's just a new, like I'm just so used to functional programming and like I haven't really had the need for object oriented like approaches 
And so I think it's just going to, it's just new terminology. So not only am I learning the syntax of how to do it, I'm also learning the terminology on top of it. And Hadley doesn't have, and you know, this is advanced R, so he doesn't need to spend time defining what object or oriented programming is. Because again, the audience of this book is for people who probably come from another programming language that understand those concepts. So it's good for me, at least it's going to be a little bit of a struggle because I'm learning terminology on top of, you know, how to do it in R. So, but we'll get yeah. through it. <laughs> cool. Well, um, I think next week, I just double check here. I think Ryan said he's going to cover uh, the start to OOP, which the, with the introduction and then uh, base types. And then um, I think that will probably take us to, and I'm just checking the schedule here real quick. I think that should take us into the dark times. <laughs> yeah. A two week break, which is always good. It's always good to kind of take it. Oh, we'll get into S3. Excuse me with, with uh, Robert, if you're still good with doing S3 and then um, we'll take that two week break and then we'll come back with R6. So it looks like base types and S3 in the next two weeks and then skip for daylight savings time and then come back on the 27th, they get to R6, S4 and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, I, if that's, if that's everything that everyone wants to discuss, I mean, I can hang out for a couple, few more minutes here and, but you know, we can end early tonight and then, um, see each other next week. Works for me. Oh, I did. I did dump that. I mean, if people got to go, go ahead, but I did dump that debugging, um, that, uh, that talk from Jenny Bryan about debugging that really goes into like, it talks about all kinds of stuff like trace back and talks about errors yeah, I got and it. talks about debugging. I got it queued up. <laughs> yeah, <Ready to> go. <laughs> it is. I will, I will probably say of, of, of the presentations that I have seen talking about like our workflow stuff, that is probably one of my top three because it just like, just seeing how the browser works is it, it's really cool. The browser is a really excellent tool. So. Cool. I'll check that out too. Yeah. I, I use, that's the, one of the only debug things I haven't really used. So hearing you say you like it a lot, I'm going to check it out now. Oh yeah. I mean, it's just like one of those things where it just allows you to like, how can I explain it? Like pause execution inside of a function. So you could peek inside of the function. And so you can like use it to like, you know, just like peek around inside the scope of the function to see what's going on. It like, it speeds up things a lot, a lot faster to help out. So, but yeah, check that out because like I said, top three presentations I've ever seen about R and how to use it. So cool. Appreciate it. I'm going to watch yeah. it right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see you guys later. All right. See hey, ya. Yeah, have a good rest of your night. Yeah. Right, you too. Have a good night. See ya. Bye.